Well, good morning. This is the Farm Doc Daily Live Coronavirus and Ag Webinar, and we're going to talk a little bit about the supply chain. Scott Irwin is here this morning, uh, along with Jason Lusk. Scott, thanks for being with us. I'm going to turn it over to you right away. Scott, of course, Ag Economist from the University of Illinois. Good morning to you, and I uh, hope you're having a good day. Well, thank you. I am, and I uh, Appreciate everyone that is uh, tuned in, especially my partner for today's webinar, Jason Lusk. Uh, really looking forward to hearing what he has to say this morning. I want to just offer a free, a few, uh, and free, uh, a few <laughs> comments about uh, uh, what's going on in the markets in recent days. This shows the uh, uh, movement of uh, grain futures prices for corn, soybeans, and wheat uh, since the beginning of the year, and uh, bad news recently for both corn and soybeans. We can see that in the last week to 10 days, both have been in a steady downtrend so that uh, soybean prices are now down about 15% versus uh, the first of the year. Corn percent, dr corn driven by the concerns about uh, miles driven, gasoline use down 20% now, uh, seeing some extraordinarily low corn prices in the country, lots of areas uh, below $3 and well below $3. Wheat prices are holding up better, down only about 3% for a variety of reasons. Same chart for livestock futures prices for cattle, hogs, and milk. And here the percent declines are much larger than what we are seeing in the grains. We see that milk prices and cattle prices are all there, right? Both are right there at about a 30% decline since the beginning of the year. Hog prices right there at about a 50% decline. Uh, we've actually seen in the livestock sector that the specter of uh, some of the supply slowdowns, even though they're getting a lot of he uh, headlines, are not. Uh, driving prices as of yet down more. Uh, this shows what's going on in the stock market and with crude oil futures prices. So we can see that the stock market has continued to hold up even with the decline yesterday, standing at about 14% uh, drop for the year, which is uh, still fairly remarkable considering the level of economic contraction that we're currently uh, apparently experiencing. Of course, in recent days, crude oil futures prices making a lot of news. Very important, the black line you see here is the June uh, WTI futures contract, and that is now down essentially two-thirds, or just right at 66%. Had been holding about 50% uh, decline uh, until roughly the last week, and now down to unheard of low levels. This is what's getting all of the headlines in the last 24 hours. Here, I'm showing the price level of the May and June WTI crude oil futures since the beginning of 2020. So this is not the change, this is the actual level. And you can see, as you would normally expect, the price of the May and June uh, WTI crude oil, crude oil futures are very, very small differences. And that persisted uh, right up until about three weeks ago. Uh, and then the May and that gap started to widen rather noticeably in the last week, but both prices were still holding above $20 a barrel uh, until the last couple of trading sessions. And then yesterday, the unheard of and what would previously have been unthinkable the May WTI contract, which uh, expires, to, well, trading ends today and the delivery uh, process starts. Yesterday, that contract closed at negative $37.63 a barrel and had a one day price decline of roughly $56 per barrel. Uh, now, I do note that this morning, uh, that the price has now come back up 
$44 a barrel and is about plus $5. And uh, this has sent shockwaves around the globe. I think this is why the stock market was down uh, sharply yesterday. And uh, I don't want to spend too much time explaining how this happened, but basically what this means is that uh, you know, we've had roughly a 45% decline in gasoline usage in the United States, and we haven't been able to shut down the crude oil taps that fast yet. And so we have an oversupply of crude oil that has now overwhelmed our storage capacity. And basically, uh, a negative price for crude oil means that coming out of the pipeline, uh, there are no alternative uses for it. You can't store it. You, there's just nothing you can do with it. You can't put it out on pasture like cattle. And so this is the price you're having to pay to, in essence, get rid of it and to use, I guess, you know, extremely expensive uh, storage by somebody somewhere or burn it off or something. But that's what the market is telling us, that this is the price to get rid of it when there's no normal use for the commodity. Uh, my final comment in that regard is, you know, like I said, this has really sent shockwaves through global commodity and financial markets, this negative price of crude oil. Uh, but I think it's important to kind of keep our heads and realize that this may not actually signal that we're going down another leg in miles driven and gasoline use, at least here in the US. This can be a situation where the total cut from coronavirus uh, restrictions on driving really don't change. This is just the fact that the um, crude oil uh, supply tap is just not being uh, cut off enough, not that our usage is really cratering again. So we'll really be wanting to watch those statistics as we move forward. So that's what I have in kind of reviewing the markets. I'll turn it back to you, Todd. All right. So if you have questions uh, for Scott Irwin, go ahead and write them down. I have a question for you, Scott. I think I want you to answer as they're filling out this quick poll. So uh, take a moment. In my local area, food items most frequently unavailable at the grocery store and fill out which one of those are most frequently unavailable. You'll get a choice of one, I believe. Meat, milk, eggs, fresh vegetables, or bread. Uh, usually, Scott, there isn't a carry or not very often a carry in the market. That's why those two lines for crude oil, that is. Um, that's why those two lines mostly were running together early on. Is that correct? Well, there's usually, usually a carry, uh, but it's not uh, typically very large. And when, you know, the scale here is so enormous, you know, the the, the scale of prices on that chart is $100 a barrel. And yeah. so and even a two or three dollar a barrel difference, which is kind of a normal maybe level carry, looks like the lines are on top of each other. Yeah, we're still filling out uh, this poll. So go ahead and finish that off. We have uh, a few more people I think probably can vote. The other thing I wanted to know, did the CME group have to do something special? I think they did in order to allow uh, negative numbers to show up. Did you see uh, that? Yes, they did make an announcement uh, in the middle of the trading day. I don't know exactly what time that they were going to allow negative uh, prices to yeah. be that was bid in the middle of the day, system. Friday, right, or Thursday? I don't remember which day that was, but um, interesting stuff. Okay, so we've got our poll there. So thirty-six percent say meat is the most frequently unavailable thing at the grocery store. Eggs at 26%, and Jason Lust is here from Purdue University to maybe give us some perspective on that particular poll and what he thought it might show and how this differs or doesn't from his um, uh, idea of what's going on in the supply chain. Jason, thank you for being with us. So why don't you tell me a little bit about the poll you just saw uh, and yourself, what you do at Purdue, and then go ahead and get started with your slide set. I'd appreciate that. Well, I think it's good we didn't include uh, toilet paper as an option. Otherwise, <laughs> that probably would have been the dominant dominant category. Uh, I think uh, eggs and uh, meat were probably two of the things I expected to see up there. So uh, you asked me to explain a little who I am. Um, I'm a 
a professor and department head of, of the head of the agricultural economics department at Purdue University. Mo most of my research focuses on the consumer end of the food supply chain, so food demand issues, but also just trying to think about linking that back through and what, what are implications that are happening at the retail level for food processes, for food processors and farmers, and, and for a variety of reasons over the years, I've, I've done a lot of work on meat and livestock issues. And so you'll see that reflected in my comments here today. Well, I think I'll, I'll just jump in and thanks Scott for the invitation to be here and thanks Todd for hosting. Um, I've been uh, handling lots of media calls over the last month. It's hard to believe it's been a month, but probably the most single um, common, commonly asked question I've received is this one. Uh, do we have enough food? Are we going to have enough food? The picture you're seeing in the background there is an image in front of a food bank uh, at in a in San Antonio suggesting that, you know, is it food scarcity? Is it, you know, people's incomes? But whatever, there's a confluence of events there uh, causing people to ask this question about whether we're going to have enough. So, um, you know, I think one way I'm going to try to tackle that a little bit and some of this, you know, many of you on the, the webinar here may know, but I think it's important to sort of, uh, uh, you know, look at the various angles of this question. Do we have enough? And I'll answer the question for you at the beginning, and the answer is yes. Uh, may not mean we have it in the places we need it, and it may not mean that we have the workers always to get it to us, but just in terms of pounds of food or gallons of uh, liquid that we want to consume, we certainly have enough to, to support us in the time being. And one of the reasons for that is that agricultural production is both location and time specific. So Agriculture is a seasonal business, and what that means in terms of commodity crops is that you know, what we have in storage now was determined last year, last fall. So that was already in storage in preparation for the consumption we were going to have now. The same is true for many other uh, food, food products as well. Uh, the other thing is, you know, in thinking about whether we're vulnerable to some kind of outbreak or, or worker shortages in certain industries, is that agriculture is also distributed across the country. So if you're, I've got several different examples, but beef cattle production occurs pretty much all over the United States. We're a little more kind of concentrated when it comes to corn for grain, mainly in the Midwest. And we start getting a little more specialized when we look at things like uh, broilers, chickens, um, you know, south, southeast of the United States mainly. And then we, you know, we kind of narrow in on some particular um, fruit and vegetable crops, say like potatoes, you can see a, a highlighted area there in uh, Idaho and maybe a few other hot spots. So there, you know, when you think about any individual commodity, we could, you know, potentially face up some more vulnerabilities depending on, you know, where production is and whether workers in that location are. But by and large, um, agricultural production is spread out and a lot of it is um, in storage. So I think the other kind of key point in this question of whether there's enough is to recognize that as a whole, U.S. agriculture is a net exporter of agricultural products. So actually over time, trade has become more important uh, for agriculture, both on the import and export side. So the, the U.S. is one of the top five exporters in the world, and it's also one of the top five importers in the world. But, you know, if things really got dire and we're not anywhere close to that yet, uh, a lot of that food we're sending abroad, we could leave here in our domestic markets if we, in fact, needed it. You know, one question people might have is, well, what, what are the foods that we import? So, at, you know, at the moment, there, you know, there isn't, uh, there aren't overt restrictions on imports of products. There, there are some restrictions, including some new announcements last night, uh, restrictions on people maybe moving across borders, but at least products can flow although there have been some logistical hurdles associated with the coronavirus. But I think just to give a sense of what, you know, what foods we rely on from other countries, um, this figure gives you a sense of that. Um, the thing that's really grown over time are the horticultural products. And these are mainly some um, fruits, some tree nuts, some of those sorts of things. It's, it's probably hard to see from just dollars how important imports are to our overall diet. So it might be more useful to look at at shares of consumption. The, um, so, you know, of all the coffee and cocoa and spices we use, what share do we produce versus what, you know, what comes from abroad? And the answer is, if you're drinking coffee right now, it came from a coffee bean that was almost certainly outside this country. So we rely on, on our 
partners in other parts of the world to supply us with coffee, cocoa, spices. Also, most of the fish and shellfish we consume is imported. About half of fresh fruits are imported. That's mainly bananas and grapes. And then you can see the various ones, you know, down below. So we're, you know, less dependent on imports for uh, vegetables um, and some other commodities. But, you know, I, th I think it, you know, again, speaks to the fact that, you know, if, if everything, you know, went south, that there, yeah, we might not be able to have our morning coffee, but there are certainly lots of other things that we could consume in this country. The other thing I think that weighs into this is we store a lot of products uh, and the, there's incentives in the market. We just heard a little conversation about carry. There are incentives in the market to hang on to production in anticipation of needs into the future and future price increases. So I've just pulled two examples for you. The top one is pork and I'm going to talk more about meat in just a minute. But if you look at total cold storage of of pork that we have on the market. Actually, there's more cold storage of pork, at least in February, than we've had in the last three years, quite a bit more, in fact. Now, we don't know the March number. Uh, that's gonna be released tomorrow by the USDA, but I, I just put this here to illustrate the fact that um, commercial, uh, you know, there's commercial storage. This is not government storage, but various uh, folks out there trying to take advantage of, of the fact that you know, we may need more tomorrow than we need right at this moment. And I think it's also important just to keep out, it's not just uh, the big commodity crops that we think about. So this is from the same USDA uh, NAS website. You know, you can find the amount of storage we have in frozen strawberries. Uh, we actually are a little below where we've been the last three years there, but there's still, uh, you know, over a hundred million pounds of frozen strawberries in storage. And if food got scarce, these are, these are inventories we could bring onto the market and into consumption. So uh, this is obviously a related question, um, you know, do we have enough? But also, you know, one of the things that led to that question is why, why are all these store shelves empty? And I think this was shocking for a lot of consumers. If anything, it probably speaks to how much we have taken for granted in our food system that we, we expect when we walk into a grocery store to really find almost anything we want at any time of year. Uh, that even goes for, you know, those, you know, fruits and vegetables that we rely on import. So what happened there? Why did we see those stockouts? Uh, these are data on uh, our movements. So it's a, it's a little scary and creepy to think about, but there are various companies that track our cell phones and attract movement, uh, attract our movement into different venues and then of course resell that data. So the orangish line is our, or our movements last year uh, and then the bluish line is where our movements this year in supermarkets and then down at the bottom sit down restaurants. So you can see what happened in middle of March, people started going to the grocery store much more often. So there was a temporary big demand spike in grocery store establishments. Um, now you can see it's already leveled off some. That it, now, you know, in fact, so much so that we're visiting the grocery store less often than we did at the same time last year. Of course, it also could be the case that even though we're going less often, we're stocking up more. So I'll show you some data on that in just a second. But of course, the other side of the story here is, you know, visitation to restaurants um, really just, you know, fell fell through the floor. And so this is one of those big disruptions is uh, that one of the reasons we saw those grocery store shelves empty is just the amount of foot traffic, uh, that kind of peak demand that happened um, grocery stores just were not equipped and prepared to handle that. So one question, you know, that kind of comes up a little bit is if, um, you know, if people were not going to restaurants as often and instead were going to the grocery store, why don't we just move that food over from, you know, one system to the other? And we could do that in some cases, but in many cases, the answer, it's because it's a lot more complicated than just that. So just to give you one, you know, example here, there were, you know, been stories about on the farm side, milk having to be dumped on the field. So we can't dump the crude oil as Scott talked about, but we can dump milk, unfortunately. Um, so there's surplus on the farm side, but then scarcity on the retail side. Well, you know, that seems paradoxical until you realize there are people in the middle. There are processors that have to move that milk through the system. And then we have to think about, well, how do we consume milk and dairy products away from home? Well, one of the big markets that was shut down were schools, right? Children are drinking milk at schools. How do, what's the form in which they drink that milk? What's those little tiny cartons, right? 
uh, that's very different than the gallon jugs we buy at the grocery store. Maybe on a slightly different scale, you know, the cheese you and I buy in the grocery store might come in little half pound bags that you see there. But if you're a restaurant, you might be buying 50 pound blocks or 40 or 50 pound boxes of shredded cheese to put on pizza. And the, the processing plants that deliver food to the food away from home market have capital invested in filling those little small jugs or creating those big blocks of cheese. And it's not like they can just flip a switch and suddenly start cranking out gallon jugs. And this same story played itself out to different extents in different markets uh, around the country. And some of the price, price fluctuations and stocking out that we saw was related to these capital investments. We have processors that are geared and have capital designed to deliver to a, a very specific system. Um, you know, I mentioned toilet paper at the onset, and that's a good example of that. You know, think about the toilet paper you use away from home and, you know, in, a, in an office building or a restaurant comes in those huge rolls, right? Uh, those, you know, we, I guess if things got dire, we could use those at home. But for most of us, it's not the kind of toilet paper we're buying, uh, you know, to bring home in the, uh, from the grocery store. So the point is that there are some real constraints in the system that, that prevent us sometimes from just switching from one supply chain to there. Some of it's regulatory. I might touch on that just, just a moment. So, um, you know, we saw movement in foot traffic, but what's happening just a total sale. So, you know, even if foot traffic fell off, we could be stuffing more, more items in our cart. So this focus was on meat here. These data come from uh, scanner data, point of purchase scanner data when you, uh, uh, in those grocery stores then, you know, s sell those data or give those data to some uh, other services. So again, you can see the same trend that happened with uh, the foot traffic, that big increase in sales of pork, beef, and maybe to a little bit lesser extent chicken, but pretty dramatic, you know, 100% increase in pork sales and 90% increase in beef sales uh, for the week ending March 22nd. Um, and then we've fallen back off. So that sort of peak demand buying, stocking up phase where people were worried about mobility and, um, and whether there was gonna be enough, it's really leveled off. And, you know, we're sitting at about, you know, 20 to 30% maybe 30 to 40% higher sales in grocery stores than we were seeing at the same time last year. So more, which makes sense because we're not buying as much away from home, but that increase in sales in the grocery store probably on net is probably not enough to compensate for the losses of sales that we've seen in the food away from home market. I thought this graph was really interesting. It came comes from a New York Times uh, article a couple of weeks ago, and this is tracking um, your, yours and mine, um, our purchases on credit cards and debit cards, a bunch of, around a bunch of different categories. And this just illustrates the wide heterogeneity and impacts in our economy in terms of what's happened to sales. So I already mentioned supermarkets on net, they're up a bit, uh, but there's some categories that are up a lot. So uh, online grocery increased, you know, close to 80% increase in in sales spending through that category. Gaming has increased. I've got two teenage sons at home and I can tell you that I think they're supposed to be e-learning, but they're playing a lot of video games at the moment too, uh, uh, when I can't keep them busy doing other things. So that doesn't surprise me. Food delivery sales up about 50% uh, and alcohol uh, up quite a bit too. But of course, a lot of things have taken, taken a hit. You can see fast food on there down about 30% or so. And then on the very far left-hand side, um, you know, just a cratering of sales in, in um, you know, movie theaters and, and airlines. So, you know, wide, widely different impacts throughout our food economy. Um, you know, I think I've shown you sales, but I think it's also useful to look at prices. So prices are a signal of scarcity. And, you know, when so stores were stocking out and people were asking, is there enough food? Um, why are these things stocking out? It's useful to look at prices because if there's a lot of demand, on, on in aggregate out there, it should we should see that being reflected in, in higher prices. So these are wholesale meat prices. Why wholesale? Because these, these are the publicly available data I have access to. Um, and you can see that the prices also generally mirrored that stocking up phase that, that consumers experience. So big increases in wholesale beef and pork prices in mid-March, but then again, a, a leveling off. Um, chicken, uh, experienced a, an increase, but curiously, uh, prices have been lower for chicken this time, uh, this time this year than was the case last year, and that, that's true for pork as well. 
um, beef were just probably approaching back to 2019. So again, in aggregate, uh, at least at this moment, uh, you know, we're not a lot worse off in terms of scarcity uh, on the consumer side of things than we were about this time last year. Of course, there are exceptions. So I've show, shown you eggs down here on the bottom right, eggs, uh, egg prices roughly tripled in uh, a week time period. And why is that? Well, you know, some of the supply chain logistics that I mentioned before, shell eggs that go into restaurants typically get sold on big pallets. And you can't, you know, eat, you know, just from a, a an asset and materials perspective, you, you need more cartons to put those eggs in, the little dozen case cartons that you and I buy in the grocery store. And there just wasn't enough of that available, but there were also regulatory issues. So once you'd labeled eggs for sale to go, you know, back, packaged uh, in those pallets to go to restaurants, there were laws that prevented people from reselling those eggs into other markets. Some of those have been relaxed, but there's a combination of issues that have prevented the flow of products from one distribution system to another. Those egg prices have started to come back down uh, here a little bit, and ho hopefully, at least from the consumer's perspective, we'll continue that, that downward trend. Uh, even though we talk about meat, I think it's interesting to look at um, different meat cuts. And what we'll see here is that not all meat is created equal in the face of coronavirus. So these are beef primal prices, and these are changes in prices relative to the beginning of March. And again, it just depends uh, when you look at meat. So uh, round chuck primals increased almost 46% um, since early March, but other cuts actually fell in price. So loin prices are about 4% uh, lower. A short plate is about, um, what is that, 17% uh, lower than was the case at the beginning of March. So it's all beef, you know, so what's going on here? Two things. One, uh, where do you make ground beef? Uh, mainly from chuck, and you can convert round to ground beef. So uh, ground beef is more affordable. The roasts that come from these products are more affordable. These are cuts that, um, you know, are used away from home, but maybe not quite as much as something like a loin. So you see the the extent to which these different products are used in different establishments. And of course, their relative price point being reflected in different prices. You can see similar phenomenon with respect to pork primal prices. Curiously here, you know, pork loin prices have, they, they rose and stayed, you know, stayed fairly high. Um, you know, why would, why would beef loin prices fall, but pork loin prices rise? You know, it could just be a relative price issue. Um, you know, uh, beef, loins are, you know, maybe double to triple the price of, of a pork loin. But you see what happened to belly prices. At one point, they were 50% lower than they were at the beginning of March. And some of that's just due to different supply chains. Apparently, we eat a lot of bacon away from home, maybe maybe more than we thought we did. Um, in the pork, uh, you know, primals, you can see towards the latter part of this data set, which ended on Friday, was, this is uh, as of Friday, they're all kind of starting to come back up and I'll, I'll touch on that in just a moment. So uh, where, where are the vulnerabilities? You know, so I've, I've tried to paint a reassuring picture from the consumer's perspective. And I, I think largely it has been a positive story. My, my perspective is that even though there was some stocking out that, that the food supply chain did a pretty remarkable job dealing with a you know, incredible disruption. It doesn't mean there isn't some pain out there, particularly for restaurant owners, and that there aren't some, you know, consumers that haven't been able to find what they want. But by and large, there's been enough food. You may not get your exact variety that you want. You may not get the exact type you want, but there's been food available if you have the money uh, to buy it. But, you know, I think we also got to be realistic and ask, you know, where are the chat, where could the challenges be? Where are the vulnerabilities? And you can see a picture there of a packing plant. And I think it's, it's where there are a lot of workers that are closely congregated in our food supply chain are the, the areas that I've been keep, keeping my eye on since this whole thing began. Uh, I think I wrote a blog post in early to mid March where I uh, kind of highlighted what I was keeping my eye out on. And from that, you know, initial point, um, I, I thought that meat, packing was one that I wanted to keep my out, eye out on. So uh, I'm showing you here a graph of um, meat packing plants. These are in particular pork packing plants. These are the 15 largest pork packing plants in the country. And if you, uh, you know, do the math on it, those 15 pork packing plants account for about 60% of all the hog processing capacity in this country. 
Uh, moreover, if you draw a circle, roughly a, a two, two to 300 mile radius around Des Moines, Iowa, 11 of those plants are in that little circle right there. So, you know, the, 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 you know, vulnerability to the, you know, shutdown or one or two of these plants is, is potentially high because these plants are large in good times. That means they have really, you know, they have economies of scale. They can efficiently process pork and get it to us uh, in an affordable manner as consumers. But, you know, one of the potential downsides is if one of these plants has to shut down, that could have aggregate impacts just given the size of these plants. And that's sort of, that's what we've started to see. So, Yesterday, three of these dots that you see here were closed down. In fact, a fourth was closed down just for a, a day for, for cleaning. And that represented about, you know, more than 10%, probably between 10 and 15% of total U.S. pork processing capacity. Beef is similar. I don't have the graph here to show you for beef, but, you know, one statistic I've seen suggests that plants that slaughter at least a million head a, a year account for 56% of all uh, cattle slaughter and and again we've seen some stories of of plant closures there as well in fact scott sent me an article just this morning that i hadn't seen that the I iowa governor had ordered in the national guard to protect some of these plants i'm not exactly sure how they're going to protect the plants from coronavirus but um but i think that speaks to the the concern and scale of the issue here so that's you know processing capacity, but what are we seeing on the actual numbers side of things? So this is daily cattle slaughter, number of head, and you can see, you know, uh, here we are in 2020 compared to 2019, you know, coming into this year, we had big uh, cattle inventories. So we were slaughtering more, you know, uh, more animals, but you can really see in the last couple of weeks, as some of these plants have closed down, that we're really slaughtering, you know, many fewer steers and heifers. And a lot of that is, because of some plant shutdowns, some of it is also due to plant slow down. So workers not showing up to work because they're worried about these stay at home measures or even spacing out in plants to try to prevent exposure from one worker to another. All those combined effects you can see brought us down, you know, uh, you know pretty significantly to where we were the same time last year. The next slide shows you the same data for pork. Again, we were, we were you know, processing more pork coming into this year just due to animal inventory numbers, but we've taken a real hit here in the last week or so. Now the big dip that you see here that happened uh, around April 13th, uh, that was probably associated with Easter and uh, closing down some plants associated with the holiday. Easter in 2019 uh, was later in the year, uh, but still actually I, I, I didn't update this graph, but yesterday's um, slaughter number was about 370,000. So that green line is going to dip down quite a bit again. So, you, you know, that's reflecting the fact that we've seen these three, uh, three or four closures here in recent days. So this, this is, a, I think, a really significant challenge at, uh, for the, you know, production side of this. You know, there's already some discussion of what are you going to do with all these animals? I mean, this, this is, this is a just in time or close to just in time production system. And, um, you could slow down animals on feed. You can put cattle out to pasture. It's a little harder to do the same with hogs. Uh, you can slow them down a little bit, but at some point, and it's it's uh, disheartening to think about. But you know, discussions of of euthanasia or some other things. I think you know, all cards are kind of on the table here um, for some of these discussions. So it's um, it, I think it's a really concerning and distressing sign, uh, mainly on the on the farm side of this equation. I think on the consumer side, we're not seeing big price run ups yet particularly for pork, we have these large inventories and storage, at least for the moment, um, according to last month's data we do. So I don't, uh, hopefully we're gonna be okay on the consumer side, but I think it's a very fluid and volatile situation uh, to keep an eye out for in the days to come. Okay, uh, so uh, you know what's ahead on, on my end, and uh, I, I um, caveat this by saying this is just sheer speculation on my part. So it's me just thinking out loud. Hopefully you can at least appreciate some of those thoughts. So, uh, you know, what's going to happen to consumer retail prices? It's hard to know. There, there are things like the, the processing plant shutdowns that I just mentioned. And I should say, by the way, this is not just limited to meat processing. There are also stories here in the last day or two of other food manufacturing plants shut down, some craft plants and some others. So that that is an across the board concern. Those things are going to, would tend to push up retail prices. At the same time, 
Um, you know, we still have food away from home basically closed down for the moment. That's a demand hit. Uh, we also have recessionary concerns. Consumers d are not going to have in aggregate as much disposable income as they had. That's going to tend to hold prices down. So I think over the longer run, these, you know, retail price impacts are somewhat ambiguous. Um, I think, you know, I'm, I'm, we'll keep my eye out for what these recessionary impacts do to, to food demand. If we look back to the Great Recession, there was a drop off in spending at food away from home as consumers' disp disposable incomes fell. Of course, we're already consuming less food away from home just because of the shutdowns. But even if we recover, we're not going to recover 100%, just probably due to the fact that people have less disposable income. Uh, the other unfortunate thing that I think we're likely to see, and we saw that in the, the picture I showed you earlier with the food bank lines, is an increase in food insecurity. Uh, there's a big increase in food insecurity rates in the Great Recession. And unfortunately, that may be the case here too. We don't, we won't have data on that for, for many more months to come. But I think from what we're already seeing out there, that's likely to be the case. Um, maybe speculating a little bit more. I mean, we saw already that the data on increased spending on e-groceries, food away from home. I think that's that was there was already an upward trend there. And I think that's likely to continue. People trying out some of these services for the first time. And, um, you know, once you try something out, you figure out, hey, this works, you, you know, you may stick with it. And some of this is pick up at the store, but other parts of this are delivery at home. And I think that delivery at home piece could well change a lot in the future. And we may have systems arising. We actually, actually already do have some of this in other locations where, um, you know, does it really make sense to have the grocery store where everybody's walking in and entering and potentially exposing each other to the, to, pathogens. Instead, why don't we just deliver straight from the warehouse to people's um, to people's homes? And when do you have enough scale there that that starts to make sense that you just, you know, have some ro robots and a handful of workers that uh, you don't have to worry about making the inside look fancy. I think that that kind of trend will increase. I think another longer term trend I can imagine are grocery stores scaling back in terms of size, focusing more on fresh items, fresh fruits and vegetables and meat, those things that many of us still want to see and pick out um, with our own hands, look at with our own eyes, but all the rest of the stuff in the store that's a little more homogeneous, that's more packaged or processed, you know, that stuff we may increasingly rely on Amazon or, or direct delivery types of services. Um, I think there's gonna be, you know, what, what do we do in the future about these, you know, meat packing plant issues or food processing plant issues. I think it's gonna you know, further increase efforts and, and there'll be calls to invest resources in automation. You know, the, the thing about processing animals and food is they're not as uniform as say putting together a car is. You know, they come in different shapes, sizes, sometimes even different colors. And that's why it makes it tough to automate, but they're, you know, they're, our developments out there, and I think there'll be further calls to do to do that. I think it'll also be the case that even within some of the big, you know, processing companies, to think about questions of geographic scale, and you know, is it worth giving up some economies of scale to have a little more, you know, production spread out in slightly smaller plants? Um, you know, it didn't make so sense when times were good, but uh, I think this pandemic has shown us times aren't always. Good, and then I think the last thing you know that may weigh in there is you know what are the regulatory barriers? Um, you know, there's there are, you know some regulatory challenges associated with people setting up food processing plants that that aren't quite as large, and you know maybe some of those uh, need to be thought about. You know, I, I think a trend that we saw on the food away from home side of things uh, in you know especially in some bigger cities were that there had been such an increase in say Uber Eats and uh, the delivery services from restaurants is that it started making sense for a lot of these kitchens to not even to open up kitchens that didn't even serve the, the customers directly at the sit down place. So you, you may think you're buying from, you know, name, name your name brand restaurant and you are, but it's not the same place you go to sit in. They just operating a separate kitchen that's solely de dedicated to delivering food away from home from their kitchen. I think we'll, we'll see some more uh, interest in that sort of thing. And lastly, uh, I think there's probably on the part of a lot of consumers going to be rising interest in local food issues, more direct farm delivery. Uh, I know talked to a number of people in this this space that have just seen interest and in orders fly through the roof. 
I mean, this is still a very part, small part of our food system, but I think that at least from the consumer demand side of things, there's going to be a lot of interest in these kind of food systems. We already had been, but I think we'll be even more so going on out into the future. So I, I think with that, I'll, I'll uh, stop talking and see if there are things that you all would like to talk about. Hey, thank you so much. If you have questions for Jason Lust, you can go ahead and write those down, put them in the question box, we'll see them, and we'll get them answered in the mean space. I would like to thank our Farm Doc uh, webinar sponsors. They include Compere Financial, Farm Credit Illinois, the Illinois Corn Growers Association, FS Growmark and TIA Center for Farmland Research. That's right here on campus. And of course, the Department of Agricultural and Consumer Economics, uh, based in the College of Agricultural, Consumer and Environmental Sciences here on the campus at the University of Illinois. Those all are supporting this webinar so that we can continue the work uh, from the Farm Doc Daily team. So we do want to Thank them very much. Looking forward to some of the webinars that are coming up on Friday of this week. We'll uh, take a look at uh, policy and political outlooks. Uh, and that should be an interesting one. Less than a month, of, co of course, Congress, Congress enacted the CARES Act. And last week on uh, Friday evening at 9 o'clock, I happened to be on this press conference that took place with Secretary Sonny Perdue. The announcement was made about how some $16 billion would be spent on the farm economy, another $3 billion that we can talk about as well. And all of that will be discussed on Friday. If you want to join us then, we sure would be glad to have you on hand. And then next Tuesday, Nick Paulson, ag economist from the U of I, and Joe Glauber will be here to talk about ag trade as it has been challenged and changed over the last several years. So those are a couple of things that are com coming up. Uh, I did look up one um, point because I thought it was interesting about the uh, National Guard being uh, put deployed, uh, not only in Iowa, but uh, I think also one of the listeners pointed out that it happened in Colorado as well. And they're being deployed in Iowa and Colorado, both in Iowa, I think some 250 of them to do contact tracing and um, some of the testing. So in order to keep the plants running, National Guard is being deployed to help um, make sure that they know where the virus is and uh, how it's been moving in those local areas, trying to keep those plants operational and to keep mostly the you know, workforce healthy in those places. So that's a couple of things that uh, I thought maybe you ought to stay up to speed on. I think we've got some questions we'd like to ask uh, that came from our audience. Jason, um, I want to know, and I saw this in the list somewhere, but I don't quite remember where, and you mentioned it as we were finishing up. How, how much of a change do you think there will be in the food industry as it relates to um, groceries that are delivered um, by Amazon, uh, maybe Walmart, I suppose, in the future. And rather than eating out those pop-up kitchens or kitchens speci speci specifically for delivery, how much of a change do you think might take place and how permanent would it be? I think it's gonna be pretty significant. I mean, we were already trending in that direction. So sales uh, from kind of grocery delivery, uh, we, we were already hitting that we need more, more, you know, uh, direct delivery of food away from home to our, to our homes. So, I mean, the trend was already there to begin with. And I think this is already going to accelerate that. I think, you know, on the food away from home side, the restaurant side of things, you know, it's, it's a little, it's a little depressing how many, you know, and how many of the restaurants are going to be able to re even reopen after this is over. And it may be, you know, the first step to being able to reopen is just starting to do more. I mean, some of them are already open by just doing food delivery and food away from, you know, the you know curbside pickup, that sort of things. But e even the ones that have been shut down entirely, that's that's the first toe back in the water. So, you know, again, I think it's hard to predict, but I, I suspect those trends will already, you know, further accelerate, um, you know, beyond what we've seen before this. Okay, so following up. Um... You mentioned that the increase in FAH spending likely hasn't been enough to fully offset the decline in the FAFH spending, and there may be a recession impacts this coming from uh, one of our listeners uh, moving forward. What do you think the decline in total expenditures have been March to April, and maybe your expectations for the rest of 2020? Yeah, so 
you know, just for some context, the USDA Economic Research Service, their numbers suggest about 54% of our, you know, like the value of, of our food spending occurs away from home. Now, that doesn't mean pounds of food, but it's at least dollars that we spend on food. Uh, so that gives you a sense of the magnitude here. I mean, the, the best data I have, I think, are the, the data, scanner data that I mentioned on the meat sales. That, you know, yeah, we increased about 100% in that one week from peak demand, but you know, through grocery stores, we're down to, you know, now we're still about 30%, 30 to 40% higher than we were last year. Now that's just grocery store. So what's happening on the food service side of things? And that's certainly down. It's not zero, um, but, you know, it's not crazy to think, you know, that might be down, you know, anywhere from 50 to say 80% uh, from where it was before. So that, you know, even if you're up 30% in the grocery store, and you're, but you're down 80% on food away from home, which is half, uh, you know, it's easy to see that total, you know, expenditures might be down, you know, 10 percent or so. That's just a crude, you know, back of the envelope kind of guess. Uh, a couple of questions about other parts of the food line. Um, one on pulses, and they're kind of related, uh, and the other on pasta. Uh, so I guess two peas. Uh, one would be wheat, the other would be lentils and uh, other things. Um, they want to know whether there will be high demand for for those, and because they're shelf stable, does it make much of a difference? Yes, I, I think so. And I, I didn't show those graphs, but if you look, there there are some data out there from the the grocery store scanner data companies. The biggest increase in sales was actually in a frozen food category. That's where we picked up the biggest just percentage change in sales. But certainly, pro, you know, the, the shelf stable. Uh, products uh, th that are out there, you know, dried beans, canned, um, and uh, it, it's some of those impastas. I mean, that 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 was, you know, those categories really increased uh, during this initial stocking up phase. Now, the challenge is what goes, you know, what goes on out into the future because you could stock up with those and put put them in your pantry, but that means you're not, you know, now your pantry's full, <laughs> and are you going to replace? what's there in the pantry. So if the purpose of those initial purchases was to stock your pantry, that's done now. Um, so what are you gonna replace uh, that pantry with that comes on out in the future? So, you know, I haven't seen, I have seen data that those categories really did increase immediately after. What I haven't seen is, you know, what's happened to them in the subsequent weeks after that initial stocking out phase. Hey, back to the first question we started with, and this is a follow-up uh, from one of the listeners that related to e-commerce and the ability to deliver uh, food in a different way directly to producer or to consumers. Um, are there vulnerable populations in some of what uh, have been termed as the food deserts? And, and much rural America would be considered that where they can't get to a grocery store easily or that the only thing that in the hometown for a grocery store might be in you know the gas station i, I think it's a great question um although you know maybe, maybe it's a little bit of a personal anecdote I, I grew up in a very rural area of the texas panhandle i think there were 100 people in my hometown we actually had food delivery service it was called the swan man and <laughs> <laughs> <so> there, <laughs> there uh there are some you know there have been some food delivery services over the years that were actually geared towards uh, rural kinds of populations um and you know i say that partly in jest but part parcel partly seriously that you know if there are market opportunities somebody's gonna arise and, and try to feel it but I, I think i have to be you know we have to be realistic in saying that it is harder you know the that last mile is is more expensive to cover um and there will be challenges associated with, with particularly with serving rural America that's associated with all kinds of other things. Rural, we were talking even right before this podcast about rural broadband and some of the same issues that come in there. Um, you know, the food desert issue, I think that, you know, maybe, you know, if there's enough demand there, I think, you know, how, how big are the distances we're talking about where we need trucks or cars to travel? Um, I think that actually is a potential solution to some of the food desert issues there. If I don't have a physical store, well, maybe, you know, Amazon will send it to me. Right. Uh, there are a series of questions related to this next topic area. Say, uh, do you see any long-term changes to how agriculture, uh, how the agricultural sector provides food to consumers? So we sort of just got into that, but uh, the series of questions I think relates a lot to how um, meat is processed, 
what automation might look like, what that cost is, and whether it's borne by the consumer or whether they find cheaper prices, uh, and if um, meat cuts can be varied in some different way that would make it more usable across all the sectors. Yeah. You know, tough, tough to know. So again, I'll put this in the category of sheer speculation. But, uh, you know, I think we have a system that that is designed to be very efficient and low cost. And I think what this situation will will cause are conversations around, you know, what can we do? You know, I think about it as a form of insurance. You know, what are the things, what kinds of production systems that are maybe a little more costly, but we might be willing to pay it because it's insurance in, you know, for a, a future time of uncertainty. And some of that may be, maybe we need more packing plants um, that are maybe not quite as cost efficient, but, you know, maybe aren't so prone to an outbreak like this. But the other side could be uh, just the flexibility and capital that, yeah, okay, this machine, am I willing to spend the million dollars it takes to, you know, box cheese in this 50 <laughs> pound block if that's all it can do? Or maybe I might be willing to look, pay a little bit of a premium to, you know, buy a machine that's a little more flexible that can do a few more things. So, you know, I think th though I think the way I would think about those things is, you know, buying some insurance. And you know, we we have changes in you know food industry all the time and the way food is packaged. It's just that they normally happen more gradually. Um, it's not like you're ha asking to me this sort of milk story I gave where you go from one week where you can sell milk one way and it's just gone tomorrow. You know, normally what happens is they're just trends that are pushing you in one direction rather than a door just being completely slammed on you. Um, so, you know, what, what are those going to, you know, exactly entail? I'm not sure, but I'm, I'm saying if I'm sitting in one of those boardrooms or talking to those folks, I'm going to be thinking about these sort of flexibility and diversifications through a, a risk and insurance kind of prism. The number of animals that are on feed at any one point in, in each of the livestock sectors. Uh, do you see that changing very much over the next 12 to 18 months? And as I think about that, you know, poultry and pork clearly, and maybe beef to some extent, um, are fairly vertically integrated. And I'm, I'm not sure that that has been able to very much. So the margin, on the margins, um, I'm wondering how much space there is to vary and if the larger vertically integrated uh, facilities would be able to do such a thing or would even try to. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, coming in, let's talk about, say, pork for just an example. You know, we were coming into this year with really high inventory numbers, and some of that was predicated on this hope and expectation we were going to be able to sell more to China because of, you know, the relaxed trade barriers and because of their African swine fever issue. So, we were kind of rationally expanding the herd in anticipation of this thing that, you know, didn't pan out. In fact, not only that, we got a double whammy from China and, and shutting down and with this virus, you know, that, that caused other all other kinds of disruption. It's, it's almost impossible to imagine that's not going to, you know, result in half a year to a year from now for lower, lower inventories, particularly if we see some of the prices we do now for, you know, feeder pigs and those kind of things, you know, how low does it have to get go or, you know, you're just going to remove animals out of that supply chain. So, um, yeah, I think, you know, particularly in those industries that are more vertically integrated pork and particularly chicken, you know, they can respond more rapidly to these changing economic conditions. And, and I think inventories are likely to come down beef, you know, just because the longer biological lags is, is probably not, going to respond quite as much, but still we, we were sort of in a phase with beef where we, we had some high inventory numbers coming in the year, but we were kind of getting to a point where it looked like we were going to have some smaller numbers on out into the future. And, and, and so we were, we were already kind of headed in that direction in beef, but it's, it's just slower to move. Because you uh, pointed us towards beef there. Um, I'm wondering what you thought of the recent price changes for cattle. Um, and the limited number of packers that are available for producers to deliver to. Sure. I mean, I, I know this, you know, for livestock producers out there, it's got to be a frustrating time because they see cattle prices falling um, and they see wholesale prices increasing and it just doesn't seem fair. Um, and, you know, I'm I, this is not the place or I don't have the knowledge to, to weigh in on market power issues or any of that kind of stuff. What, what I will say is, you know, that, that some of those price changes uh, are what we would expect from these economic conditions. So if you, re if you eliminate capacity for, 
whether it's a fire or whether it's a worker illness shutdown, that reduces demand for cattle, it pushes cattle prices down because um, you you know you don't need as many to because you, you don't have a way to process them at the same time. Then that means there's less meat on the market. So there's uh, consumers are bidding up what's remaining on the market. So that pushes that margin wider, but it, it doesn't necessarily mean the packers are making more money. Um, the costs are often increased. I mean, they could have shut down any of these plants they wanted to before any of this happened. The fact that they didn't <laughs> suggests to me that they feel like they're better off uh, running. The fact that they're really trying to make sure they're up, you know, continuing to up and run suggests to me that packers would prefer these plants to be running. Um, and so, you know, again, I'm not gonna weigh in on, you know, who, who benefited relatively more or not. It's quite clear livestock producers uh, did and are taking an enormous hit. And I think that's you know really dis disconcerting, Scott Irwin. We have just uh, a couple of minutes left. Those first two questions there, I think maybe you might want to throw run through very quickly. Um, somebody wants to know if it's possible for crude oil futures to go into negative values outside of delivery. Uh, yes, that is theoretically possible if it takes you know uh, a couple months to get the as I like to say the crude oil tap. Uh, turned off. Uh, this could extend uh, for several months. You know, if let's say the crisis continues, it's more severe in the COVID pandemic than we expect, and we have to shut down even more of our crude oil production. That takes time. We could overwhelm things for a couple months. So, in theory, that could go on. Personally, I do not expect that because we're making adjustments to our uh, production and shutting that tap down as fast as we can. And just offhand, is the May contract in expiration, about to go into expiration? Today is the last day of trading on that contract and the way delivery works there, then it goes into a period where the contracts that are still open at the end of today are then settled over a period of a few weeks with physical delivery. Gotcha. Uh, the other question for you, uh, could you discuss the outlook for DDGs, cornmeal, soy meal, given the disruption in protein and ethanol production? I don't know whether you can do that in a minute and 10 seconds, but give it a shot. <laughs> I'll give it a shot. Uh, right now, uh, the outlook is uh, obviously not good. Uh, what we basically, I'll, I'll answer it as quickly as I can this way. What we need to happen is for China to continue opening up, which will increase uh, purchases of both DDGs and soybean meal and probably some corn. Uh, and we need the uh, US uh, to open up as soon as it's safe to do so, so that we can have the same kind of recovery domestically. And until that happens, uh, you know, the, the outlook is not very positive. Uh, and... I guess, Jason, um, we're at the end of our time here, but did you look through questions? Or is there any last thing from the questions that you wanted to make sure you answered? I was mainly just trying to hope uh, Scott would bail me out and answer some of those hard ones that I already received, but he, he let me flounder <laughs> on my own. <laughs> All right. Um, anything on vegetable oil before we go? Maybe, maybe not. All right. I think we'll wrap it up. Thank you so much, uh, Jason Lusk from Purdue University and Scott Irwin from here on the University of Illinois campus for being with us for this Farm Doc Daily webinar, Coronavirus and Ag. And thanks to our technical director today, of course, Jim Boltz. Uh, we didn't get to all the questions. Um, that's unusual. I'm glad you were you were all here and that you asked a lot of questions. Um, we'll try uh, in the future to get to more of them as, um, quickly as we can, but uh, an hour is just about as much time as I can take and the rest of the folks can uh, manage as well. Thank you for spending this much time with us. We do appreciate it. You have a good afternoon. I'm Illinois Extensions, Todd Gleason.